It's Virgin Radio, I'm Tim Cocker and I'm here with a British band of 25 years. They've seen many other of their peers come and go. They've had some incredible highs, some crushing lows, and they're still here loud and proud with album number 10, Tallulah, out now. Fida, Grant Attacker, welcome Hello. to Virgin. Hello. Thanks for having us. Right, let's start at the, at the very start. Um, so you named yourself after a goldfish. <laughs> not strictly true, but yeah. Oh, is that not? It was, n not really. I think it was some like crazy press story that was made up in our early days to make it, you know, kind of more interesting. I mean, you know, the name Feeder, it was kind of, at the time we were, it was all the kind of Britpop bands and you had people like, you know, um, Sleeper, there was a band called Breeders who were still going. And there was, there was lots of bands with the sort of two E spelling and it seems to be quite a trend. There seems to be trends with names. So we were trying to be part of, sort of fitting with the whole Britpop thing, even though we weren't at all Britpop in our music, you know, sort of sound. Um, so that's partly why we use the name Feeder, but the fish thing came from, um, it did, it actually came from a fishing book. It's a thing called a swim feeder. I used to do a bit of fishing when I was a kid as well in Wales. Um, so we used to kind of lost the uh, swim bit and just kept the feeder. But it was, it was really just the way it looked on paper. We sort of liked the way it, you know, the sort of two E spelling and it just fitted in with everything else that was going around at the time. Um, even though we didn't musically. <laughs> so there was a bit of poetic license, but uh, all right, so yeah. I'm going to oh. make it my mission to get to the Sorry bottom. Sorry to ruin the story. No, I'm going to get to the bottom of some of these <laughs> myths and legends uh, throughout yeah. this, this conversation. But you, you touched upon Britpop. You picked a, an amazing year to start. 1994, yeah. one of the great years for music when you look at it. Yeah, it was a pretty, it was a pretty exciting time for the UK, yeah, wasn't it? Was, it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. we were... We were kind of more of a mid-Atlantic sound, so we were being influenced by both sort of US and UK sounding bands. So I think Britpop bands were more on the UK side. We were, we were sort of somewhere in the middle. Saying that, we still worked, you know, really well on, on the Britpop billing that, you know, that we were playing with, you know, all the bands that we were playing with at the time. Um, and we started to build, you know, like a very loyal fan base, mm. didn't we? Just from playing and playing and playing. But it was a really good time for guitar bands, I think, you know, in general. Um, yeah. So that suited Good days, us. 90s. Yeah. And obviously America, you know, had all the grunge scene as it was called. Yeah. So we kind of fitted in between the sort of two really. So it was... Yeah, when, when I look at the bands that, that were in their pomp and emerging yeah. in 94, you, you had Oasis and Blow and people like that. But also the one that jumped out at me that I thought, well, I wonder whether that's what you would have latched onto Weezer also appeared in 94, that sort of yeah. fuzz, fuzzy distorted <clears> guitars. <throat> Yeah, and also like a band who are very song based. I mean, so Weezer had that slight bit of comedy side to them, you know, certainly in their videos. You know, there was a lot of humour with that band. Um, but definitely, yeah, I mean, sonically, we did definitely worked, you know, very well with those kind yeah, of bands, yeah. didn't we? And we were always sort of fans of Weezer as well. Um, but yeah, it was a really exciting time. It was quite a challenging time for us because we weren't part of the trendy mm. thing that was happening. So we had to really work hard to build a loyal fan base. And then suddenly, you know, record companies started to hear about us and started to come to our shows and realised that we were not just a loud three-piece sort of grunge band and had, had some songs as well. Um, but, you know, obviously you mentioned people like Oasis. You know, we're not that dissimilar. You know, the songs are very, you know, they're very song-based. You know, a lot of them start off on acoustic guitar. Um, you know, we have a lot of fans who are Oasis fans who come to our shows. So there's obviously some connection there, you know, in our, in our music that they get as well. And you came to the band from a newspaper. Is that a myth? Is that an urban <laughs> myth true. as well? Oh yeah, well I used to work at a Japanese newspaper uh, company, and uh, yeah, it was a part-time job, but it was uh, good, good for me, you know, kind of part-time job and doing the band, and uh, it worked well. And you, and you hadn't initially seen yourself, Grant, as kind of a, a front man. You, was, you, you were going to be the person making you, you, other bands sound great. Yeah, well, yeah, I used to work in studios. Um, I moved up from South Wales and I was trying to get a job actually in Wales at the time. I couldn't get, I couldn't get any work in any... I went to Rockfield uh, Studios and trying to get work there. There was, there was no vacancy. So I literally got on the train, went to London and just kind of knocked on doors. And I only got the job because the guy that owned it, um, John Wadlow, who ended up being a manager for SEAL, remember SEAL? He, he was a big fan of Wales, and because I said, I've just, come up, I've just come up from Wales, can you give me a job? He goes, oh, come on in. I just got on really well with him, and I worked there for three years, you know, T-boy, tape op, and then I, I started to engineer, you know, a bit. So that, that was a really good education for me. But Attacker, I think what you meant as well with the newspaper was that he, um, oh, he, a, he put an ad in oh, loot. Yeah. Is that, I think, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, so, yeah that means and yeah, then, because yeah, yeah. we, we sort of started off uh, rehearsing in Wales, we had a temporary bass player. Um, and then we were auditioning for you know some new people. We must have gone through 10, 15 bass players. Just couldn't find anyone that could actually play that well, you know. And uh, we weren't sort of after like an incredible muso, but we just wanted someone that could play a bit. 
And then I saw an ad at Tacker put in Loot magazine, bass player, kind of available, in, into James Addiction and like Chili Peppers. Yeah. And I, I think you James, James Brown. Brown as well. I thought, Reggae. sounds interesting. Yeah. Didn't, didn't know where he was from. I just called him up one day. Mm. Um, I knew he wasn't English. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you hadn't been in London that long then. So, you know, you were no, not, not married. That long. Well, yeah, but you, you got married very quickly, no. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, and we saw yeah, that yeah, yeah. in Camden. Yeah. And the rest I also of... had a lot of audition. And, uh, you oh, know. okay. <laughs> well, you know, like, like Grant was saying, because I did a lot of auditions, so many people were just, just, you know, miles, you know, let's start band together. But uh, finally I got, you know, Grant's call and uh, met up, Grant and John. It was so simple, three piece, they got songs, they played really well, and uh, yeah, it's so easy, yeah. I think I gave Tack this little demo <laughs> cassette that they the, the recorded in, in uh, Wales, and it was sort of, you know, it was quite an important part of our sound even now, that, you know, that demo, because it, yeah. it was the start of our kind of, you know, heavy guitars, but, you know, really strong melodies, and, you know, we're, you know, we're like a, almost a heavy metal pop band, really. Um, and he really liked that, and that's really what started it off, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we went, we found this little tiny rehearsal room in King's Cross that was owned by this really interesting American. He was American, wasn't he? You know, the oh, guitar maker. Guy, yeah. Can't remember his name. And he used to let us, you know, rent the room upstairs, and it was tiny. Dusty but he was room. he was constantly doing, you know, stuff on guitars downstairs, all the kind of dust and stuff. <laughs> it, was, it was a really unhealthy place to rehearse, but it was a yeah, it cheap, was cheap, and it was yeah. all we could afford at the time. Well, there's a blame, there's a claim. You never know. Yeah, that, that could be. Uh... I'm going off on one there. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. <laughs> it's all right. No, 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 not at all. So, 1997, mm. you released Polythene, and High was the first song that really connected. What did that feel like when, when you had this thing that you'd sent out into the world and, you, and it started to get mm. a real tangible response? Yeah, well, because we did Swim first. Because yeah. Swim was part of Polythene Recordings, really, but we felt, because we were such a new band, we didn't want to put out an album, it just goes out and it's gone. So we were sort of testing the water with Swim. And then, um, you know, when we eventually dropped Polythene, I hadn't actually, I hadn't actually written High. So the, so the original version of Polythene hasn't got High on yeah. it. Um, and I wrote it one day just in my flat in Camden. I remember playing it to my girlfriend, who's now my wife at the time. She 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 got really emotional, you know, sort of tears in her eyes, thinking she was just convinced that this song was going to be, you know, going to kind of be the one that's going to help us, you know. And it, you know, so simple, but I I felt like it had something, and uh, and we re-recorded it, and I think we re-released the album and added high. Mm -hmm. Spent the best part of a year in America, and it was and it you know got a fair bit of radio yeah. playing in the UK as well but i think mm -hmm. it showed people that there was a bit more to us than just the kind of loud heavy mm. you know how, do you remember how you felt at the time did it feel like mm. this is it this is the spark <sighs> or did, were you thinking we better just enjoy this because this might be it or yeah I mean, yeah i think you never quite know because you know we knew lots of other bands and some are getting huge record deals and then getting dropped out really quickly so we were like oh god you know we have to really make sure we've got a song that's going to keep us mm. keep the label happy but I didn't write High for that reason. I mean, we've always had songs that, you know, like High. In fact, when we signed our record deal, you know, with Echo back in the day, um, there was a few songs then that were in that vein, and they were the songs that really helped us to get the deal. It wasn't just the heavy stuff. It was, it was, oh, this band can do that, but they've also got some songs, you know, that can possibly get on radio. So it was always there, like bubbling away, but I think High was the one that really kind of reinforced that, yeah, wasn't yeah. it? And uh, yeah, I mean, I just, just kind of remember doing the demo and it was just something special about it. And it, uh, I, th I think the original recording we did was just acoustic guitar with like, with, with like a string quartet and it, that was going to be it. And then it went from that to being this sort of more anthemic song as you know it now, which is sort of mm -hmm. more of a classic feed of trademark sound. When you look back, quite often bands in the early stages are so hungry for the next thing, mm. they don't enjoy the moment enough. Did you enjoy that period? When you look back, it was good fun. Yeah, yeah, it? it was good it's, fun. Yeah, it, it was pretty, it was um, pretty exciting time because you know we were sort of trying to get a record deal, and then suddenly, hey, there's some labels in you know in, into yeah. the band. I mean, it took a long time. It was you know a lot of work, and not just that, but dreaming of being in a band since you're ten years old, and it's suddenly, it's you know it's becoming like you know we might get a record deal. It was a big deal for us. Um, and it was it was a hard time, but it was really exciting. And mm. you know, as you said earlier on, it was it was a great time for music. I mean, like the nineties was a really good time for you know, to, yeah, you know to be in a band. band yeah. It was you know before social media and all that stuff. It's far more rock and roll. I can tell you, <laughs> it really was. But no one really knew what was going on because no one really you know no one had phones or anything. So it was pretty. Um, 
it was it was a lot more mm. well what would, they, what would they say a bit more risky <laughs> <laughs> raucous Definitely a bit more raucous. Yeah, yeah, I've heard award shows these days aren't quite what they used to be. Not really, no. I mean, there was a lot more characters around. I think people, um, you know, I'm not encouraging people to be idiots, but <laughs> I, think, I, I think people are scared to to be, you know, to sort of let themselves go a bit now because they're so worried about what people are going to think or what's going to happen to yeah. them in the media, you know. And it is, it is a different world now. You have to be so careful about everything, which I understand. I mean, there is some idiots out there, but I think you've still got to have a bit of fun and be... You know, you have to enjoy it and you know show a bit of personality. You know, but because I think that's what kids sort of like about bands, and that's what people like about. You know, they kind of want. You know, they all want to be in bands, I think, in some way. You know, they all want to live that lifestyle. It's still there, but it's just different to what it used to be. Yeah, but you're right. The people that are authentic characters yeah. now are the ones that people really latch onto. Yeah, I know. Because it's few and far yeah. between. You're right. I'm, you know, talking about Liam Gallagher. You know, he's still. I mean, he's such a character, and it's <laughs> like you know, love him or hate him, he. You know, there isn't many like him around and you know and i find that quite endearing and uh yeah it's a different world <laughs> so you've got stories to tell maybe we'll get some of those yeah, out got of a few, you. but yes <laughs> uh, 1999 yesterday went too soon you continued that mid mid-atlantic sound uh, yeah. as you said where did that come from you think because um i was thinking like the track insomnia you mentioned mm. south beach palm trees everglades you're from newport yeah <laughs> but it also mentions yeah, the white valley in the middle eight if you listen, I didn't, I'm it mentions it, 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 the White Valley, yeah. That song was written after being in America for a year on tour, going a little bit cuckoo. Um, mm. It was a great time, but we were exhausted, weren't we? Yeah, we were. Fl flying back and forth, do festivals, go back, you know, back on tour in America. I mean, it was a dream. We did 42 states in about nine months. We really did do the whole full American dream, you know. Um, so, yeah, that song was really thinking back to those times touring then and... Also, as I often do in um, a lot of feeder songs, sort of kind of flashbacks to kind of growing up in Wales and you know what made me start, you know, um, kind of wanting to be in a band or like discovering music. But yeah, it's that kind of it's that perfect mix really of kind of what we are. I think that mid Atlantic sound, you know, it's always going to be there. And also, I like songs that um, that lyrically are quite universal. Mm. So there, it makes the songs mean much more open. It doesn't doesn't matter what country you're from. I think people can can, can can I relate to them, you know, in some way? Um, it's quite a natural thing for us as a band is to do that, but it's something which I quite like, you know. I love Tom Petty, you know, his songs are very much about America, but I still find a real connection with them, you know. Um, and that's what we've always tried to do as a band and I've always tried to do as a writer. And, and what lessons did you learn in that period as well? Because what came next suggests that you had really honed something. What you mean with the uh, yeah, next? Yeah, uh, with, with, with the next couple of records that came. Yeah. Um, it, it seemed like you 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 got yourself to a point where mm. you were ready to you were ready to go. So what what when you look back at, at those early times, what yeah. lessons do you think you learned? What little nuggets mm. could you share with a with a band on their first couple of records? What I would say is I think what kept us going. I don't know how you feel was we had there was enough songs on each album to keep us going and to keep the label on board. <laughs> Because it was as simple as that, you know, for everyone. doesn't matter. And, you know, the more money that was being spent on that band, the more pressure there was on you. We've always been on, you know, we were on Echo, which were a kind of indie label. They were kind of a hybrid label. So they had, you know, they had a little bit of money, but they weren't like a big major. So we didn't always get maybe the massive push that some bands had. But at the same time, we had, you know, we had quite a lot of freedom, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. The first album true. was quite a tough time, wasn't it? Yeah. It was a bit, it was quite hard for us. And then... And then, and then, then they seemed to sort of trust us and let mm. us sort of just kind of leave us. You know, I think they had confidence in the band after yeah. that. But our second album, uh, Yes, They Went Too Soon, which I think is, you know, actually a really interesting album. Sonically, it's maybe not the best sounding record, but I think there's some really good songs on that. But I think we did lots of recording. Yeah, we, we did yeah. We did loads of recording. Mm. We were just like kids in a sweet shop. You know, they just yeah. let us in the studio. We were there for ages. And I was just like turning up, hey, Tucker, we've got a new song. We just turn up and do it. <laughs> and it'd be done in the afternoon. It was it was such a fun time. Didn't have any producer. Um, but, you know, okay, if if we went back and did that record mm. and maybe work with somebody, it could possibly sound better. But I think we that, that was a really magical time for the band. And it's, and, and it's when we started to sort of broaden our sound a bit more. We were experimenting with strings and keyboards more as well just to show that we weren't just about the fuzz box all the time. Although that's still a massive part of what we are, you know. Um, 
the feed of fuzz boxes. Yeah, that's, that's but that's element. what. Yeah, but that's what set up a lot of the later albums, you know. And I yeah. think, uh, and then we got into Echo Park, which is a whole different thing again. Yeah, well, let's talk about that. Did you realise before it was unleashed on on the world, before people started hearing? Did you realise what that you'd created something? A monster that was going to was going to last. <sighs> I, I, was a bit, I was a bit unsure about the whole thing, wasn't I? Yeah. yeah I, I, yeah. I was not particularly happy making that record. I, the hard work, wasn't it? Yeah. It was. Yeah. I mean, I. I, I how did you feel? You, it was. It was different process, yeah, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Because. Uh, yeah. You say. Yeah. I think. Yeah. It's hard to explain, but we. I think because we just been left to a, you know, our own devices and stuff. I mean, you know, we. Could, you, you know, we knew how to make, how to get good sounds. I mean, I worked in studios and stuff, and you know, we're all, you know, we're pretty musical, so. You know, us in the studio with a good engineer, it's never going to be that bad. But it went from that to working with a really big producer, Gil Norton, who's amazing, but really different and very tough. <laughs> so, you know, the ego took a bit of a bashing at times. <laughs> and, you know, just difference in opinions about how he wanted the record to sound. And um, But Gil makes amazing records and he's, yeah, and, yeah. you know, he's a dear friend now. But it's it was just a very different, it was, it was a real learning curve or just just a learning process you know and I I take on board a lot of the stuff that he did for us um, but it was just a different we just said we just said you know it just hadn't worked that way before you know working on Pro Tools for the first time yeah. it just felt like everything took forever so we, we, we were just like come on just <laughs> yeah, do another I one. suppose that's, that's interesting <laughs> especially when you think of the you know an iconic feeder tune Buck Rogers yeah. um, was and I mean this in in yeah I'm, I'm Risking offending you when I say no, that. That's all right. It's the simplicity of it. <laughs> yeah. Right? It is, but that, that's that's the magic of it. It is, but well, it's just it's just like a demo. I mean, we were we were trying to work with Gil because you know we love the Pixies mm. and stuff like that, and you know, Foo Fighters and all the bands he's worked with. I thought he was American. I didn't even know he was from actually born in Liverpool. And um, I'll try and keep the story short, but it's basically Gil's wife, uh, Fran. Um, I think she liked Feeder, and I was was always saying to Gil, oh, you know, you should work with Feeder sometime because you'd really like their stuff. Because Gil, you know, he's really into guitar, song-based bands, and um, so it was kind of, it was sort of, you know, bubbling away, wasn't mm. it? Us working with Gil because he was so busy and so hard to get to, um, we just didn't have a chance. And one day, something happened where Gil was working with a US band, and they they'd almost finished their album and they were short of a single. And I think Fran had mentioned us to Gil and then he spoke to his manager. He called our manager and said, would I be interested in maybe co-writing a song or would we be interested in doing a song for this band and see what happened. So I started to write some songs. But Rogers was one of those songs, just guide lyrics, I'm very drunk one night, <laughs> drinking some red wine or whatever, thinking that if they like it, we get to work with Gil, they, they can change the lyrics or whatever. It didn't ever happen. It, you know, it, it ended up being played to our to our label, to the head of our label, saying, "This is a smash hit. You can't give it away." And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> I just didn't really get it. I didn't expect that song to be anything. And I remember being in the studio with Gil, having a bit of an argument with him because um, I changed all the lyrics on it, got rid of all the you know all those <laughs> sort of throwaway lines, that sort of fun. You got a brand new car. And he said, oh, God, you've absolutely ruined it. If you don't, if you, if you do that, it's not going to be a hit and you're going to kill the song. And we had this big sort of debate about it. And in the end, I said, OK. So I just kept it as it was. The whole thing was just me just doing a few lines just so, so they could hear the melody of the song. And the only reason why those lyrics were even came about is because I think I'd just broken up with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. <laughs> and she was going out with this guy who was making a car advert on TV. And I was seeing somebody else. So I was obviously still a little bit not quite over her. He's got a brand new colour, so it's probably a little bit bitter at the time, and that's obviously where those lines came from on, on a drunken night. So you would have got. I did say it was a boring. The, I did say it's a boring. No, no, story, that's not that brilliant. So but, if but you'd have had your story. way, if you'd have had your way at the time, <laughs> you would have got rid of drink cider from lemon. Oh, definitely, yeah. Or, or is it eleven? See, that's eleven. No, well, yeah. well, it could be. It could be. I mean, this is that a, caused arguments in the playground. I can tell you. Or as Jeff said last night when we were playing. Um, or it could be Melon. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a bizarre song, but it's one of those songs that everyone knows, whether they love it or hate it. And it's become... Um, it's it's yeah. fine. You know, I think, I think we've got much better songs, but that song does a certain thing. Well, you know, <laughs> it, it makes it, it makes people turn into a big sweaty, sweaty mess. I've got I've got you to thank for so many times I've DJed at an indie disco, dingy little yeah. place, and it's it's, a, and it's I think it's off. I think it's sort of it's outlived all the critics that song because you know 
it's it, it's still there and, it, and it's become a bit of an indie anthem so you know you can't really complain about that and you, you know when you're playing to a festival you know feel 60,000 people whatever and they're all jumping up and down to that song yeah that's true we can't really complain can we no <laughs> and you, you um again another track that didn't feature on the album but but came out afterwards. I mean, that's very Noel Gallagher-esque, having a song like Just A Day. Oh, I'll just have that as a B-side. Well, yeah. There, <laughs> there is a bit of a story behind it. Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm doing all the talking as well. Yeah, uh, but um, basically, we w it was our second album. We were signed to Electra in America, who, who were a huge label. And uh, it was Yes, They Went Too Soon. They, and they liked the record, but they thought, we don't really hear the big single in America on the album, you know. So, okay, you know. So I wrote that song quite near the end and yeah. I played it, you liked it, yeah. and then we sort of went in and recorded it, didn't we? And then the, for some reason they wanted to release the album at Christmas time in America. We're like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to just bomb. So we had all this like, dispute with them. In the end, it never came out. We, we left the label or, or they fired us, whatever it was, kind of got dropped or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, the song just became just like this kind of sort of leftover song. It didn't ever yeah. get used. So it was a B-side on Seven Days in the Sun first. And then it got picked up by Gran GTT, Turismo. Yeah, Gran Turismo. Yeah. And it was the lead track on this game. And that literally, the combination of that and the video just made it a cult yeah. feeder classic, I suppose. It's so weird because that song was like, it was just kind of, yeah, in fine, just B-side, whatever. And then it ends up being on a massive yeah. game. It wasn't even on the album. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not just that song, but quite a few other feature tracks. We, you know, were on that game, and it and it really introduced us here to a massive audience. Yeah. But yeah, that song for some reason, and especially in Japan, yeah, they go absolutely crazy. How was that it. for you, Taka? <laughs> yeah, well, it's great. Um, even when we went to the studio, they are actually programming in a Grand yeah. Christmas. We are invited, and uh, yeah, I, I hear lots of people came from you know gamer. Mm. Game people, as oh, to find out uh, songs and the uh, and the band, and now it came to come to the gigs. That's a, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. It was Prodigy were on Wipeout on the <laughs> Sony PlayStation, and you guys were on yeah. Gran Turismo. I remember. Yeah. yeah, we did a few games actually, but that was well, I think we were on the two Gran Turismo, weren't we? on both of them. It was in yeah, two, yeah, two as well. Yeah, yeah, there was a, but we've done a yeah. I mean, those games were huge then, and um, yeah, it was it was quite a good launch pad for us. That I think I think that definitely didn't do our career any harm. No, certainly not. <laughs> And um, that, that that got you to this level that you got to, and then um, you know just over a year later, Comfort and Sound. And we can't talk about Comfort and Sound obviously without acknowledging mm. John Lee, yeah. um, because that album hangs heavy with loss. Obviously, how mm. often is uh, John still in your thoughts now? Well, I don't yeah, know. I can't tell Taki, but all the yeah, all the time. Mm. I mean, the thing is, we started the band off together, and then I, you, know, you obviously met Taka, and we were you know we it was the kind of you know, the start of theatre, so it's always going to be there. I mean, you know, to be fair to other people that have played with us since, I mean, you know, we've, you know, we've had some amazing drummers, but John, I don't know, you know, it's just, you know, it was our, you know, we were like a little family, weren't we, mm. you know? And, um, you know, he was a great guy, you know, great personality. He was, you know, f fantastic in interviews, and I could just sit back and do nothing, just let him do it. But, um, you know, and a fantastic drummer as well, just sort of full of energy, wasn't mm. he? You know, he, he, he was a bit of a rock and roller as well, you know, he liked to have fun. But it was completely, you know, it was a real shock. And, mm. uh, you know, me and we didn't know, yeah. you know, what to do, really. It's still, it's still it, as I'm sure it does for you, it's still, it still upsets me. I get days where I think, like, I can get quite emotional about it. But time has passed and, the, you know, obviously life has to go on. But I'm just grateful that what it did for me on a personal level is it pushed me more as a writer, I think, and made me maybe write songs I probably wouldn't have done before or possibly in the same way. So... Comfort and sound. It wasn't. Oh, let's do a new feeder record. I just, I just couldn't quite deal with it. I know Taka was finding it really hard. So we just had a little bit yeah, of time out, didn't right, we? You yeah. didn't really sort of. Yeah, you know, we were in touch, but we weren't. Yeah. We just had a bit of a break to see what, what you know, what we're going to do. Because we thought, hang on a minute, is this, is this the end of feeder? We've lost John. Have we lost the band as well? We just didn't know what to do. Because we were a three-piece band as well, and because John was a very sort of popular part of the band, we weren't sure whether fans would want to see feeder without John. I know the songs could still be there, but. We just weren't sure, were we? Mm. We weren't sure if we wanted to do it without him. Anyway, cut long story short, I I went off off the rails a little bit, started drinking too much and just spending most nights in my local pub, just not knowing how to deal with it. And then um, I just suddenly started to write music again. And uh, I locked myself away in a little studio in Crouch M called The Crypt, 
with an engineer called Matt Syme who's worked on a lots of feeder stuff and uh, the songs just poured out of me and I remember I think I got quite a few together it must have been it was at least maybe yeah. eight or nine I remember calling Tacker up because I was, I was really nervous to play it because I wasn't quite sure whether he you know, wanted to do feeder still and I wasn't sure what was going on but we met up didn't we and yeah. I played it to him and I could see that he really liked it and we went to the pub and got really drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when we decided to carry on. Yeah. Um, but the album was, I didn't know what to think of it, but it was, it had something, you know. Mm. Um, there was a few songs that came after that were key songs. I mean, Just the One Feeling was the last song that was actually written for the album. Um, and probably the best well-known um, song on the album. But I think if I hadn't, I'm not sure if I, if we left it too long, if I hadn't maybe have gone in the studio and pulled myself together a bit, you know, whether we it would have just sort of drifted away. I don't know. Because, mm. I mean, we'd still achieved a lot as a band then, but it wasn't enough to have another 10-year career, I don't think. So, you know, I'm really, you know, I'm sort of really grateful for, for that album, Comfort yeah. and Sound, and the fact that, you know, whatever inspired, mm. you know, all, the, all those songs. Because, you know, it's not an album, it's, you know, people, I don't want people to hear that record. I don't think you do either. And go, oh, that's the album about John. Because it's not, it's an album just about how we dealt with it and how I dealt with it yeah. as a writer after he had died. And it's the same for people. People lose people in you know, life all the time, which is why that album, I think, connects with people. Because, you know, whether it's, you know, loss of family member through, through illness or whatever it is. Um, yeah, all of our yeah. emotion yeah. in that album, I and think. Not, yeah. not just about the songs, all the playing, everything about mm. it. And it was a really special record. And... Uh, but I think a really universal record. That's what made it successful. I know there's, oh, that's the, that's the album that you know that Grant started writing after the drummer died. And I think like, well, it is, but it's not, it's not an. It, I think it's a really optimistic album as well. It's quite, some of it's quite positive, but it, but it's about dealing with something which is quite hard to deal with or quite dark, but kind of finding some. You know, some positivity in yeah. it as well. Quite yeah. a brave thing to embrace as a songwriter, isn't it? it, it yeah, it was. So I don't think I was that aware of it at the time, though. I was just writing the stuff. But some of those songs, I don't, I don't even remember writing some of them. You know, I mean, I would say "Hand on Heart." A lot of those songs are more about, you know, it can be about anything, anything that's, you know, that's any black cloud in your life. You know, um, whether it's like, you know, uh, depression or you know, loss, whatever it is. But I would say, hand on heart, I would say the only song I remember writing where I was definitely had John on my shoulder was um, a song called Child in You. And that's the one I still find quite hard to hear now. I find that when it's a very simple little song, there's something in the sound of that song that I find really sad. That's mm. the one that really gets me if I hear the album now. But otherwise, I find it quite an uplifting album. And I hope other people do as well. Yeah, for but sure. It was, yeah, but it was, you know, that's probably our biggest selling album. So it was unusual to for that to happen, you know, after what happened, you know, with John. Yeah, and I think that demonstrates that it wasn't mm. um, it wasn't people that were already invested in yeah. you who had gone on that particular journey. It was yeah. the, it was the universal nature of it. it. Yeah, it made it connected with a lot of people who didn't know Feeder. We, we would have made a you know a really good album anyway. I know that because you know we were we were pretty confident then. I had loads of you know, ideas. I mean, even started to do a few songs with John, like Come Back Around and even Godzilla, the early stages of it. Um, so I have no doubt yeah, we made yeah. a great record. It probably wouldn't have had Child and You on it, but it would have. It still would have been you know, a good rock album. Whether it would have been as successful, I don't know. But um, but I think after John sort of died, it, it probably pushed me, uh, pushed me even more you know, or maybe think, or just maybe uh, not be scared to write about stuff I probably would have felt uncomfortable writing about before, mm. you know. But anyway, but uh, it was, you know, it's it's definitely, you know, one of our, I'd say out of all our albums, um, I suppose it's like the Feed of Holy Grail, that one, isn't it? Just because of, mm. it was just the biggest record, wasn't it, by far? What was the live comeback like? It was at Reading Festival. Was it your oh, first yeah, time it was, you played live again? Was what was really that? really hard. Yeah, I, second stage, I was in a mm. bit of a weird headspace that day. I, yeah. remember. I think all of us were, weren't we? Mm. So it, it was the most amazing audience I've ever... It was, honestly, they, it was incredible. Because we played the big top. It was, it was the enemy, huge yeah, yeah. tent. You know, yeah. you, you know, like the massive ones. I mean, it was... You literally had people... There was like rows of people, can you get a tent, just kind of listening outside. It was unbelievably busy. I've never seen a tent like it. 
they all came to sort of like to see us and like give us their support. You know, it was a really special gig mm. as far as that goes, but the actual performance wise, I find it really hard to get into it. Mm. I don't know, I just found it was such a big gig to come back to. And I, I, and I, just, I don't know, it was, it was yeah, tough, yeah. wasn't it? It was tough. It was yeah. tough, but the audience were absolutely amazing, you know? It was just kind of, um, yeah, I think we hadn't quite got our heads around it. <laughs> but, you know, what a return, though, to come back and have a tent like that. It, it, made, it did reinforce our, you know, our kind of decision to carry on, actually, when we did that gig. And you mentioned those sort of concerns, like, you know, is yeah. how, much, how much is people wedded to it being the, the, those specific three people? And, yeah. the, and it's the songs, yeah. above all. And we had Mark Richardson on drums, it was in Skunk and Nancy, and, uh, you know, we knew Mark from touring, and, you know, John got on well with Mark. And, uh, well, in fact, we knew Mark before he was in Skunk and Nancy. He was in a, in a band called Blow, who we toured with. And, uh, you know, he was a really, a, you know, real powerhouse of a drummer. Completely different style to John, but he, we, we just wanted to find somebody, yeah. you know, quickly. So, you know, he came in and filled some very big shoes and, you know, did an amazing job. Um, you know, it's always difficult when you're working with somebody who's been in a really successful band before. There's always going to be a little bit, you know, of, uh, you know, a give and take. But, you know, he did an amazing job. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it did, it did start to get easier, didn't it? Mm. I, think that for, I think the first few shows were the ones that I felt, felt quite tough. I just found it hard to, um, to sort of get my head around it all. And then, and then it started to settle in and then we were back, back doing what we do. You know. and, by the, and by the time the next record arrived in 2005, you were combining that with fatherhood. I know Taki, you'd all, you had already become oh, a dad yeah. by that point. Grant, <laughs> you were a, you're a new father. Yeah. How how has how's families and children changed changed things? A few more grey hairs now. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, well, I mean, it makes me sort of, I do sort of sympathise a bit now, even, even more for Taki and John, because, you know, I didn't have kids you know, when they did, and it was probably easier for me just to be doing, you know, what I do. Because, you know, it's, it's hard going away, you know. And I've got, I, I've got, you know, so my daughter's like 14 now, my son's almost 12. Um, I used to find, you know, I, even now, I mean, they, they don't need me there all the time now, but I used to find it really hard going away on tour and stuff. I used to find it really difficult. So, I don't know if you did, but it is hard, isn't it, leaving your kids? You know, yeah, really, it is, um, yeah. You know, when, you, you, when they get a bit older, they'll be like, yeah, fine, Dad, you can go. But... Um, <laughs> But I also but imagine you it, must you must worry. You don't don't necessarily yeah. worry less, but you worry about the important stuff. You realise yeah. what is the important. I mean, stuff. definitely for me on a writing level, it's given me so much. You know, it's made the the whole musical canvas. You know, so much bigger. Um, it's just given me more to write about because you know you, you think about issues you didn't think about. You know, yeah. when you're a young band, just doing you know what you do. So no swearing then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it definitely makes you worry about certain issues, you know, um, that you maybe didn't worry about as much when you were just sort of young, carefree and crazy. Um, and it's just been a massive change just in your life. I think, I think sometimes when you have children, if you're in a band or if you're a writer, it can sometimes it can go the other way where you, you're happy just to, to, to sort of like do what you do, but you don't quite have that, that drive or inspiration anymore because it's all taken up, you know, with the family. For me, um, I found it gave me like a r even more drive, and it might sound really weird. I don't know why it might be because I'm feeling the pressure of got to support the family or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> got miles to feed. Yeah, I don't know. The yeah. ki kids, kids, you know, it, it can be really hard having kids at times. You know, it can be a lot of stress. You know, you know, especially for the mums. You know, when we're away, but it's. Um, I don't. I found it really inspiring, and it just made me uh, it actually gave me more drive. You know, and and this whole period as well in, in the mid two thousands. By this point. Um, Guitars weren't quite at the forefront in the way that they were. No. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I, I you were swimming been, against the tide a little bit. Yeah. I think that's been a case yeah, for quite a lot of our album releases, but you know, <laughs> after the sort of sort of nineties, yeah, it's all down to you know the sort of you know musical climate, isn't it? You know, I think some of our, some of our better albums came out at a really difficult time, and not just us, but you know, lots of other guitar bands. And I think if that album had come out then, it would have been such a big record. But every band has probably got that story. Um, it's yeah, it's it, it's all down to timing, isn't it? Yeah. And having the right record at the right time. But also, music business was changing yeah. a lot, and the uh, trend also changed to more hip hop and R and B, mm. and the less and less guitar yeah. band on the TV or the radio. You know. It's all down know. to how the media want to sort of push bands, and I think you know. I mean, you know, I like a lot of you know hip hop and R and B mm. stuff if it's done well. You know, my kids, you know, you know, listen to all sorts of stuff, but. 
it was just sort of difficult for guitar, you know, for guitar bands for a while. Unless you were a very young, oh, you're the next trendy band, and there was you know one of those every every six months, you know. Um, I think I think the real shame with you know with what happened was not just for us, but even for young guitar bands is you know some of those bands had really good songs, so you know they should be on the radio as well, mm. and it's all about that really. If you if you're not gonna if the media doesn't want to embrace that at that at that time, it's very difficult. So you, then you have to rely on your fan base that you've got, and and that and, and it's sort of you know you just stay yeah, kind yeah. of where you are. You go out on tour, it's great, but it doesn't really sort of do that. I suppose there's been a big technological shift as well as you touched on Tucker. And um, one thing I notice is like with uh, with my kids are a little bit younger yeah. than yours, Grant, and obviously younger yeah. than yours, Tucker. They. Uh, Eras and genres don't really matter. They'll listen to mm. anything. So pe people can find yeah. your old records in a different context. <laughs> what what um, you know, what I would say about social media and you know streaming and all that stuff, um, I think in some ways it's really positive because there's not that kind of you're into rock, you're into R and B. Yeah. Like, people, kids just like you know sort of music as one thing now. So they don't really see a difference between the Arctic Monkeys and a feeder thing or a, you know or a Billy Eilish thing. It's just Good songs and music and people that you know, they just find something in all of that, and I think that's that that's actually really positive because the problem with a lot of going back to the '90s, the only thing I didn't like about it was there was too many trends. It had to be like this Brit, but there's Brit rock, and there's always then there was the Welsh Brand, scene. Here's it's, a Parker jacket. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was all about that. It was all about oh, they're, yeah. you know, and then we're going to write about them because it's all you know, and we were like, who cares? You know, we just want to write some songs that pe people might, mm. might actually remember in ten years' time. That was always our plan. And, that, and that's still yeah. <laughs> that's still the plan, but um, so I think I think kids have really got some really good open minds now. So I, it's not a bad place for music at the moment. Um, I'd like to hear a few more guitar bands on the radio, you know, because um, there's some great bands out there, um, old and new. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's just a different world now. It's a yeah. completely different world. It you know, it takes it takes a bit of getting used to for us because mm. we're old school, but. Oh, well, you had to accept it, isn't it, to get, yeah. in, get on. Yeah. How, how do your kids review your uh, your old records? Because they're, they're probably yeah. uh, they're probably not afraid to be honest. What, what oh no, think? kids are never afraid to be honest. Every time <laughs> yeah. I'm doing a new song in the kitchen or something, yeah. oh, they're, they're, we try to be cool dads, <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> it's I think I think my I think our kids are pretty cool about what we do when we're doing the band stuff. But when we're not doing the band stuff, we're probably just like, oh god, just another uncool <laughs> dad. Which is the same for anyone. Anyway. I'm sure it's the same for any any big yeah. rock star in the world or pop star. I'm sure like Bono from U2 goes home and, he, and his kid thinks the most uncool guy ever, or maybe, they, or maybe everyone thinks that I don't know. But um, it's just you know everyone's everyone has their life outside what they do, no matter how famous they are, whether they're biggest biggest actors in the world or whatever. When they go home, it's back to reality, you know. But you don't you don't strike me as a band that have ever <laughs> got away, got away with yourself. You think you've always been pretty much on the ground, right? Yeah, well we've never really we've never really had an ego ramp, <laughs> you know. We never had that massive sort of big hype so maybe that's kept us sort of grounded but we're not I don't think we're that mm. we're not those you know we're not that kind of personality as people anyway I don't think you know you, you know we, you know we're confident in what we do and we believe in what we do but we don't want to feel like we got here just by hanging out in the in the good measure during the Britpop scene every night and, <laughs> yeah. and you had a fair break as well after Silent Cry there was a I mean I know there were solo records and there, there would have been other things that you were bubbling on and, and feeder were always there in the background yeah. but in terms of records it's quite yeah. a big. That's quite a big span of time. What? Yes. How were you through that attacker? <laughs> were you on the phone to Grant all the time? Come on, fella. Yeah, on, I went, uh, yeah, I went to Japan and just spent some time, you know, with friends and family. <laughs> we did. I mean, Taka was doing some solo projects as well, and I thought it was meant to be. Let's take a year out, and then, but a year's not very long because by the time you actually record a record and you do it, it's like oh, another year's gone by. But I didn't actually plan on doing a solo record. I mean, honestly, hand on heart, I was just gonna. I was asked. I get asked to do some writing for people sometimes, and I'm not very good at doing that because I put most of my time into feeder, and I've never really felt the urge to do that. Although financially, I'd probably be a lot better off if I had. <laughs> it's not something I have a burning desire to do, but if if it comes up once in a while, I'll, I'll you know maybe try. Anyway, so I was, I was just writing some acoustic songs for, for, for some young artists, um, and it, that's how it started. And then I got very attached to the songs; they felt very much. You know, quite close to my heart. A lot of songs about family and my kids, and just that slightly different headspace to the whole feeder headspace. <laughs> um, and it just became a solo record. I didn't even plan on even putting it out. I thought I'm just going to make this album just for my kids. 
and they can just have it you know, and say, yeah, I wrote this for you, can you listen to it or whatever. And then I got like a little deal for it, put a little band together and uh, ended up doing quite a few shows on the back of it. Um, it was a really enjoyable time for me. I did miss doing Feeder and I obviously felt, oh God, you know, Attack has finished his project now and it's been like a year. So I did feel a little bit of guilt for that. But, you know, as, fr as frustrating as it probably was for, um, you know, for Tacker and, and the team, I think it was a good thing in some way for us because I think it really... I don't know, when we came back, it just felt like really, really fresh to me. And I think it, it certainly helped me as a writer anyway. Um, sorry about that, Tucker. No, but, right. uh, yeah. but, you know, well, he did a solo thing first. <laughs> um, so it's, it's good for you to yeah. be in nature. Get yeah, hit, it was. Yeah, being a, I was, I was being a bit of a hippie. Yeah. I, just, I went through a total hippie stage. I was you know, shooting videos in the woods. I loved it. It was, it was a part of me. I, I've always wanted to do that. And... Uh, it was, yeah, I've sort of ticked that box. I mean, I, you know, if Itaku it, it does another solo thing and there's like another, hopefully not four years off, I'll do it a bit quicker. Um, you know, I will do it again possibly, but feed is my main priority and always will yeah. be. And I, it, things have to fit around feed for me. Yeah. So there was the... Uh, I answered your question. You did. After an eight-year break, <laughs> there, there, was, there was another record. And then it's now looking at it with, your, with the new album, I think the, the best of album was... A, that was perfect timing because mm. I mean I know there was a, there was new tracks and it was still looking forward yeah. but um, it all, almost bookended a yeah a big chapter. Well, we didn't want we were asked to do a best of quite a few times. And yeah, we were like, yeah. no, we don't want to do one because it feels like oh they've been away for four years and they've just come back and they're doing a best of. It's just do loads of festivals and you know make some money and then go away like a lot of bands do. We're like, no, we're back to you know we're back to make new music. That's why you dangled that little carrot exactly. of new, new track on there. Yeah, mm. well, there was eight, there was nine well, new yeah. songs. It, it, it actually songs. came, you know, with a standalone album called Arrow, but because of the way it was all packaged, yeah. it didn't really, it wasn't that obvious, but it was almost an album, sort mm. of, you know, kind of nine songs is an album, isn't it? So there was, there was a lot of new music on there for ourselves and obviously for the fans as well, who had already possibly bought some of the other singles. And as you said, it was, it was. It, I think it was a really good move doing it then because it reminded people and reminded us of what we had done up to then. Yeah, you, it was only then that you go, oh my word, look how many tunes they've got. Yeah, somebody told me that, uh, I don't know if it's true, but someone said that the video we just done, or the one before the one we just done, was our 49th video. How bizarre is that? Apparently we've made 49 videos. You don't remember, Apparently. you remember whole I, can't, I mean, you don't, you don't think about how many singles and they go... So and so top forty. So and so top, you know, four top two. Top I'm, I'm five just thinking albums. of the X Factor voice. Yeah, now saying I, that. I just you just don't think about it when you're in a band and you're busy. I don't think anyone does. But it, you know, but when you see it in front of you, think, God, actually, yeah, it's mm. quite a few. See, I was surprised. I wasn't expecting you to be surprised at how well, big well, two you were, weren't we? I, yeah, yeah, I was. quite a lot. And yeah. I think it made me, in some way, it was, it was quite nice. I thought, well, you know what, whether people like the band or not, you can't take that away from us. And that's been through just doing what we do and just hard work, you know, and uh, and also having, you know, a fantastic fan base. But uh, yeah, it was it was just good time to do that record. It was. Fusing two things together, you said yeah. fantastic fan base and you also mentioned music videos. Do you think you deserve a um, a, a bit of commission from <laughs> from YouTube and yeah. Carpool Karaoke and all these <laughs> lip sync battle type shows? Because you're the music video for yeah. Just A Day. Yeah, I, yeah. I with mean, with no giving camcorders as it was back then to your fans i know i know the person that's the very last idea on that music video okay if you did want to get the, the thing back <laughs> right. together he's now uh, he works in radio he's a producer wow. and it's still his um claim to fame that he's um is he is he about mark. nine is he about nine foot tall yeah is called he mark i think i might i i don't know but i did meet someone that was in the video and he was in radio and he was yeah that'll be him he's he very tall he's at the end the air. I think it might be the same guy. Yeah. So, but yeah, um, I, th I think you need yeah. to go after James Corden. For, hey, come on, <laughs> yeah. it's our idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was. It, I mean, that video was way ahead of its time. I mean, I'm not going to take credit for it. It was down to yeah. uh, David Mould, the um, a video director that we worked with previously on a few rec um, on a few singles. A really talented guy, and uh, we were on tour with REM in Europe, and we didn't really have time to fly back and do a video because we were right in the middle of a busy tour. So we were like can we shoot a video and not have, you know, I'm the band in it. We're like, yeah, yeah okay, fine. Yeah. So he was watching you being framed like one night. This is before <laughs> YouTube and all that stuff and had an idea thinking, well, Feeder have got really diehard fans, you know, and they've got some really great fans. Why don't we just set something up saying that they're auditioning to be in a Feeder video, thinking that they're going to get the part, whatever, just get them to film themselves, doing anything they want to this track. 
and of course they got all these hundreds of videos in, picked all their favourites, chopped it all up. Genius. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I remember when we first saw it on tour bus, like, yeah. oh, you mean John sat there with some beers Ooh. and we were like, we were like, it's great. we oh, looked at each other, I remember John looked at me and just went, like I was like, what is this? <laughs> and I think, I think we came to the sort of conclusion that it was either the best video we'd ever made or the worst. We were totally on the fence yeah. with it. But, yeah, end up as and luckily that, enough, yeah. it sort of went on to be probably one of the most sort of recognisable feeder videos that we've mm. ever made. Yeah, and, and you, know. you do have diehard fans to, to the extent that I know you're doing a load of in-store yeah. shows and signings and stuff with this latest yeah. record, but you, you weren't able to for, at, at one point in, what, 2001 or something? Yeah, right? we did. I think it might, yeah, it was around that, well, it was then or maybe just before that. We were playing uh, HMV, I think it was Portsmouth, Portsmouth and we were doing sort of full band performances. I think we won three piece some, weren't we? I think we were. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah so it was, it was like classic feeder, three piece, you know. And uh, yeah, our, our gigs used to get quite, you know, lots of mosh pits going and crowd surfing. But so they all decided to do it in the shop. We, we were like, yeah, brilliant, yeah, yeah. come on, let's do it. So you could take your rocking out. And all, suddenly all the sort of seed, all the shelves started getting knocked over <laughs> and CDs getting broken. The, um, yeah, the shop manager wasn't very happy. And apparently we had a, a ban from HMV or something for a, quite a while. Yeah. Pretty rock and roll, though. That is. It was. It, it, is. it, it, it was. It was a great gig. Yeah. It was like being at sort of like a Nirvana gig in, in, in an HMV store. <laughs> Which brings us to, uh, and, and as I say, the, I think the best of record was it was a perfect time and it hinted at what's to yeah. come. Uh, but Tallulah out now, your 10th studio album, maybe 11th if you count Swift. Yeah, I suppose. For, well, well, or Arrow. Arrow as well. <laughs> You've, yeah. had a, you've had a few, but yeah. uh, here we are in, in 2019, and um, yeah, this feels like a coming together of a lot of the strands mm. from the past. It's, it's got that, that the energy of the early records, it's got that yeah. sort of nostalgia of yeah. comforting sound at times. The thing is, you know, we do what we do, and I, you know, it's great to experiment as a band and try new things out, but I know for a fact, if we came back with an R&B record, people are going <laughs> to think, what is going on here? Um, it's not out of lack of you know, experimenting or liking other music. It's just that, you know, we have our sound and we, it's all about the songs for us. And people can criticise that, but I couldn't care less. It's this album, I think, after, after living with it now for a long time, because I listen to a lot, I listen to it a lot before it's come out. It's just, you know, checking the mixes and we're making sure yeah. we're happy with the mastering and sequencing the artwork. I mean, it's been a real labour of love, as most feeder records are. I realise it's got, I think little kind of snippets of all our records on one, which I've never probably managed to do before. It wasn't planned, it's just the way it came out. It could be a combination of having the best of, playing those songs again, a um, bit of a new spark in the band, you know, from doing... Mm. I mean, if you do summer festivals, it does, it does, it's a whole different vibe to doing touring. Got to win over. Because you're winning over a lot of new yeah, people, yeah. lots of really young kids as well. It's, not, it's all age groups. Got to remind them that these were yeah. feeder songs. These songs yeah. that you do know, <laughs> I and actually, that. the amount of people that did know them, these were, you know, some really young kids were singing hi. I think, how did you know that? It must be the mum and dads yeah. or older brothers and sisters. And it was just like, wow, we're obviously doing something which is, you know, which is connecting with all age groups. So this album was really written with that kind of positive feeling, I think. So there is some classic, slightly heavier moments on the record, songs like Kyoto and stuff like that, and more old school songs like, you know, Windmill. But that's still very much part of our DNA as a band. And I'm, I'm, I never want to move, you know, I never want to lose that because that's what makes it feeder. You know, uh, I'm not saying that we do, you know, one experiment, it might be, a, you know, we've done songs with loops and haven't got any heavy guitars on, some lots of keyboards and stuff like that. But this album, I think, to cut a long story short, um, hopefully it will tick a few boxes for people that like what we've done over the last 25 years. Yeah, I mean, like the, the just the, well, mm. I'd be interested. You said it's snippets. Where, where, if you could put youth on another yeah. record, where would you where would you plonk that one? I, I would put that on yesterday went too soon mm. to me because it sort of ticks that kind yeah. of evergreen insomnia thing. And I haven't, you know, we haven't really done a song like that for a while, yeah, have we? True, yeah. but if, if you listen to All Bright Electric, which is you know one of my favourite feeder albums, which is the one that came out after we've been away. Um, I mean, I mean, I mean, I love that record, but it's a very different record. It's much darker, and heavier. <laughs> it's more riffy, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's still like you know, yeah. it's still like very melodic. It's almost not bluesy, but it's got a slightly different f feel to it. That, I think that was, you know, that was probably quite experimental in mm. some way for us. Mm. This one was really back to 
um, well, certainly the first half of the record is very much back to that yeah. classic, more, you know, up, summery, indie rock that we do. But it, it just came at this time. It's, you know, it wasn't planned. You know, I think it's better not to plan stuff sometimes and just see what comes about. I think it was after the first sort of few songs felt quite upbeat, then the album took on a slightly different shape in the second half to keep it interesting, you know. Um, you know, we're not kidding ourselves. We're not trying to say, hey, you know, we're, we're all men, but we can still do the indie tunes. It's, it's, in, it's in our blood. That's what we are as a band as well. And it's always going to be there, you know. Um, yeah, look at Foo Fighters and all these bands, and they're still. I mean, you know, Dave Grohl's pretty much our age, and he's he's still doing it, isn't he? Nothing yeah. wrong with that. No, I, I just I remember <laughs> I remember when we started playing Youth uh, on Virgin. It was uh, yeah, it did, it mm. just transported you back twenty years. It was, <laughs> well, music you know, in a beautiful is, way. Well, music is the fountain of youth. That's yeah. why I love it. You know, it's like you know we're not trying to kid ourselves. We're, we're young kids, but you know, music makes you feel a certain way and it makes you feel, it can make you feel happy, make you want to jump up and down. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what you are, you know, age you are. Um, and that's why I call it youth because it kind of makes you feel youthful sometimes. And that song is, it's such a simplistic kind of lyric in that song, but it touches on, I, I think people hearing that song, who were diehard feeder fans from day one, it, I'm sure it, it kind of reminds me of that whole nineties period, maybe being at sort of college and hearing our songs. It's, it, it's also a classic kind of road trip song. I, I think people could, you know, Sometimes you've talked about kids. Sometimes when the kids get a bit old and they leave home, you're kind of left a bit. People seem a little bit lost sometimes, um, and they go on these road trips and kind of, you know, rekindle their their youth or you know relationships. And I think it's a song that touches on that as well. So um, it's you know, Fear of Flying is another standout. Um, standout. Track. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's one of my favourites. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a good fun for live as well. Good song, to, yeah, you know, to play live. I think it's got that classic it's sort of. Slightly darker you know, verses, but with a more uplifting chorus, which is very much a thing we like to do. Positive, negative. Um, but yeah, that song really touches on it. I mean, I kind of wrote it based on our experiences and people we've met in bands. Uh, but I had this kind of almost female kind of character in my head, sort of taking, sort of taking our experiences and putting it into this sort of made up pop star or rock star but sort of how and that how how you know that sort of fear of it suddenly you know you're being on top and suddenly well you can't always be doing that you there has to be a time where the plane has to land or whatever um and that and and it addresses you know lots of stuff like social media mm. it's a whole different world now and it can be tough even you know just reading comments on facebook alone can be tough you know even from your fans because everyone's a critic now Whereas in the old days, I mean, even if the fan didn't really like yeah, you, you're single, yeah. you didn't really know, but you, you know, they might come up to you after a gig if you're signing an, in an album and go, yeah, I didn't really like the new single. And, that's, and that was it, really. Now you, you might get, you know, put out a new single, think it's the best thing ever, and you get some people and it's like, it's hard. <laughs> you you, you, you know. named the record in honour of, <laughs> of an eight-year-old child, I, I gather, friends, friends. Yeah, well, yeah. well, that's where the name came from, yeah. um, yeah, Tallulah. She's, uh, she's a real character. And uh, I mean, the song Tallulah, when I was writing that song, it was more really about talked about the change in life of having kids yeah. so I kind of had her personality in my head but also just the change in you know having kids is a huge thing you know yeah and, and that's what I was, you were just touching on the social media there I, mm. again it, it, you can tell that children have had this huge effect yeah. huge effect on you and um but does that in a way mean you can ignore all of all of that stuff, social media, or is that maybe just the years under your belt? I know a lot. I like mean, if you were a young band just yeah. going through without the, the yeah. family, the experiences. Yeah, well, I think it's a bit easier, but you know, I think it's hard for anyone to, you know, to be criticised. It doesn't matter what people say, oh, yeah, I don't ever read my reviews and all that. <laughs> so, like, yeah, of course you do. Yeah. Or, you know, you're going to see it somewhere. And, you know, you might get 10 good ones and then one absolute howler. It might just be that, it could be that journalist not even listening to it, or maybe just wants to make a point. Who knows? Um, I'd be lying to you if I said it doesn't wind me up still, because I think, it's a good record. Give it a chance, you know. But everyone's got their everyone's got their opinion. Um, do, don't get me wrong. Our, you know, I mean, in general, our fans on you know social media, both new and old, are really good. You know, we don't get. It's not that bad at all. I've I've read some other bands ones, and some people get a really hard time. And the bigger the band, like the worse it is. Yeah. You know, it's it's tough. I think you just got to just not not let it get to you too much you know some people just want to get in the you know you know just want to get some attention on there and they're probably a bit lonely at home and they'll put something on there just to get a reaction that's just the way it is but 
not just in music though, I think you have to be very careful because even just, you know, my daughter at school is now 14, you know, it can get very hard for some kids, you know, social media. So it, it, it is, it's, it's a very powerful thing, but it can be a very dangerous thing as well. There's, um, I was just thinking of the, the other bands that would have been around when you started that are still out and making new records now, bands like Stereophonics. Yeah, yeah. And I don't just say them from, from you know, South Wales Connection as well, but Manic Street Preachers too. Mm, yeah. But then Noel Gallagher and, and Liam yeah. Gallagher and all the rest of it. Do you bump into many of them and reminisce? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, uh, I saw, um, I've, um, I've seen Liam a few times. And yeah, he's just, yeah, studio, no. I haven't seen Noel for, I bumped into Noel the last time at the Ivan Novello Awards, I think. Just saw him there and I just heard, uh, but um, my parents bumped into Noel in a cheese shop in Barnaby High Street and had a conversation with him and said he was, he was actually very friendly to them. Um, bizarre, but true. But yeah, you bump into people sometimes. I, I saw Kelly at the Tom Petty gig in Hyde Park. Um, uh, but yeah, we don't, yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, usually it's, it's at something like a Tom Petty gig or a Neil Young gig. Well, obviously not Tom Petty anymore, but uh, you, you often bump into people, isn't mm. there? But I imagine yeah. between some of you guys that have they've seen all those things, as you say, seen all these changes and remember the real yeah. rock and roll days um, of the 90s, there must be like a look and a stare, sort of a knowing nod between... Yeah, I mean, you know, we're all, <laughs> you know, we're all very competitive, you know, everyone knows yeah. that. But, I mean, I've got, you know, huge respect for a lot of bands. I mean, the Manic Street Preachers have had, a, you know, yeah. they've, had, they've had an incredible career and, you know, I'm not comparing us, you know, necessarily, but we our journey hasn't been that dissimilar to theirs. Mm. Um, and you know, they're a great band and they do what they do like really well. You know, there's a perfect example. Like the Manics, you know, they've experimented a little bit with a bit more electronic here and there on a few albums. But when they do what they do really well, it's just great. And that's what yeah, songs. And, and, and yeah. I think they know that. And that's what that's what you want from them. As long as the songs are good, I have no complaints with that whatsoever. In fact I, I hope they stick to that because it's they're one of those bands, you yeah. know, they're iconic, you know. Um same with their you know, same you know, people at Oasis, you know, you know, when they come back and reform a couple of years' time. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Noel. Uh, it's, um, I don't know, certain bands, you don't want them to lose what, you know, you, you want the song. I mean, the secret is, the hard thing is, those bands being able to keep up with having songs that are as good as ones you like. That's, that's always the challenge, isn't it? And that's always a challenge for us. But that's what you have to work towards, isn't it? I mean, you know, I... I love the Foo Fighters, but some people like their earlier work more than the later work. But they're still, you know, one of the biggest bands in the world. Yeah. And they're still kind of doing what they do, aren't they? Well, they know what they are. And I think with every Dave everyone you've mentioned... He's never going to change what he does. No. He's, he's not going to go out and make a... Well, <laughs> I, I think it's highly unlikely he's going to go and make an electronic jazz fusion record. But, well, he, he went and did uh, uh, a couple of experimental records with the, oh, yeah, he does all with that. The, tri the road trip around yeah, America yeah. And, and working with various people. Whatever yeah. that. Everyone has to go through this. Yeah, but yeah. even when he does stuff with Josh Homme and stuff, and he's doing, you know, the old desert, what do you call desert. And I mean, you know, it's still kind of guitar, rock and roll. I mean, it's different. Mm -hmm. I think he might be doing something now, I was told, with um, a Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top and Josh Homme and him might be doing it. That's what I heard mm -hmm. on the grapevine. Mm -hmm. That'd yeah. be interesting mm -hmm. if it happens. Um, you know, it's really good. You know, you can still experiment a lot in rock. I'm not saying you have to stick to the same formula all the time, but bands who have careers... Who, who 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 get recognised, you know, for that sound? There's a reason why they've had, why, why they have careers because some there's something in that sound. And that's what they do. I think my point is, you know, it's great to experiment and to try and keep things fresh, but you don't want to lose your identity as a band mm. either. You yeah. know, if you could plug one person into your band just for a bit, ooh, that's quite a good one. Probably mentioned a few just then. Uh, well. Can you say more than one? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. So many great people. I mean, yeah. I mean if I say, I mean, I, I know it's an obvious one. Um, okay, I'll give you a few and then you, we do a few okay. each before we have to wrap up. Um, PJ Harvey. Oh, wow. That'd be awesome. You said that. Did not oh. hear that coming. Well, we, well, we, why are we going to say that? Yeah. There you go. I really, I, I really like, um, I really like Karen from. I can't remember her second name now, but from the Yeah Yeah Yeahs. Karen O. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. What, I think, I, I, I think she, I, she's just really cool, and I just mm. really like the, her, her her style. Yeah. Um, I really like Billie Eilish as well. I know she's an obvious name, but she's got something, and I I really like connect with her. I know she's a lot younger, but there's something about her that I find really interesting, and I actually like a lot of the songs mm. as well. That would be really interesting. Yeah. Um, mm. Like, come and get me, please. Come on, Billy Tanya, Come on. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. If you want us to do any. Yeah. Um, 
actually, you know, so many great people. I mean, you know, look, so many talented people out there. Yeah. Uh, just trying to think. Well, I mean, there Taka, you go. Taka, you took PJ Harvey out of Taka's well. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. So only Ill, well, I mean, well. I, I mean, obviously, it'd be great to have, you know, sorry, Jeff, but it'd always be great to do some drums, you know, with Dave Grohl, you know. <laughs> He's just an awesome drummer. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely magic. I mean, actually, I wouldn't mind. I know it might be a challenge, but I would like to do something with Billy Corgan as well f from Smashing Pumpkins. And uh, Beck. Beck, yeah. yeah. I mean, Billy Corgan might be an interesting one. He probably could be hit or miss, but I do. He's into wrestling as well these days. So. He's into. He's, he's yeah. He's quite a character, but he, but he's a great guitar player. And you know, it doesn't matter whether you like what Pumpkins are doing now or not. Some of their early work is just absolutely fantastic. You know, they're a great band. Before I'm done, I've just got. To, I need to finally ask you: Is it true you're a, a very skilled trumpeter? No, I'm not. That's that's rubbish. I okay. did learn. Tr I, you I, tried. Did, I did get to grade five, but I'm terrible now. And, and I was in the school orchestra, but I wouldn't say I was very good. I was only a second trumpet. I used to mime half the time because I hadn't been practicing my scales. Okay. <laughs> and and Taka, you're a, a, a highly skilled. Well, chef. Would that be over over egg and well, chef? chef. Well, what, what's, what's his best dish? <laughs> Grant, oh, I haven't tried all of them, but he did. He, he's done some. Really, what's that thing you do in the water? In the bag in the water where you do the shit. Where he did that oh, really yeah, yeah. good. Um, he did a really good. Yeah, but always they love a Japanese curry somehow. Yeah, you know, Japanese curry is good. Cuts, cuts curry. Yeah. 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 I, I'm Easy, not, but just. Uh, I, right. I'm too nervous to cook for him. Actually, I'm not, I'm okay. You know, I'm not. I thought myself as being a, you know not a bad cook, but. I think I think Taka's on a different level to me <laughs> after seeing some of his pictures. But um, I have tried some of his food, and it's you know it's really good. Although I I am quite good at salmon teriyaki. <laughs> oh yeah, I tasted. It wasn't yeah. bad, was yeah, it? Yeah, that's great. He yeah. ate it. Yeah. <laughs> so I take from that we've got a Billie Eilish compilation album coming soon. We've got a um, a, a trumpet solo in the next record, oh, and, a, and a cookbook from Taka. Yeah, but congratulations go. on Tallulah, on thanks. 25 amazing years in music, and thanks for coming into Virgin. Th thanks for having Thank us. You. Cheers. Thank you. The Chris Evans Breakfast Show and the best music, Virgin Radio.